All right, in the last video, we talked about talking about epidemiology. And specifically, uh, the public health process of attempting to prevent a, a serious problem, and in this case, we're calling it myopia. For the moment, we're going to assume that we all are in agreement that myopia should be prevented if possible, in order to prevent some expensive and not very accessible to the general population of the world uh, procedures to fix it once you get it. And acknowledging that single vision lenses uh, probably aggravate the problem, which is the usual uh, standard of care that, as I said, will probably change within the next 10 years or less. So um, we talked and, and we've started to look at activity, outdoor activity, as a possible cause. And that seems uh, at first a little out there as a rational reason. And so what the Zatnik and the the Arinda study group uh, did was they decided to continue this study and actually expand it. Arinda is, I believe, is the name of a kind of a rich white suburb in California near San Francisco. And so they expanded the study to include uh, Hispanics in Texas. African Americans in Alabama, uh, Asians in Southern California, and just a number of different centers around the country that focused on getting a more diverse uh, population. And so uh, the CLEAR study looked to uh, follow people. They started again, first to fifth grade, and, and they entered in the study, and then they were followed for as long as the study was maintained, and that was, you know, eight to ten years. So there's longitudinal data again, and so that gives them the opportunity to start with a cohort, and uh, before they're myopic, and then follow them until they become myopic, some of them, and then put people into different groups, and then look to see what their characteristics were at the beginning of the study. Again, there were two components. One was an exam that looked extensively at the right eye and all its characteristics, ocular characteristics, and a parent survey of activities and other demographic information. So uh, what they found was that uh, they had they came up with 731 incident myopes and they defined an incident myope as 0.75 diopters or more on cyclopedic meridian and 500 or oh, actually it's kind of I think it would be less uh, minus 0.75 that's interesting. And 587 emetropes, they, de they define an emetrope as someone between 0.25, and I believe that's minus 0.25, but I'm not sure. They say that's copied out of their text, so <laughs> maybe it is a plus, uh, to one diopter. Uh, it probably is, actually. Think about it. And, and what they found was they had data that went from minus five years through the onset of myopia to five years plus. And they did the same thing looking at hours of reading, studying, computer, TV, and outdoor sports. And then they looked um, at the difference, they age-matched kids here, 
And actually, they built a, an emetropic model. It's confusing. I'm not going to go into that. But uh, they looked to see um, if there was a, a difference between emetropes and myopes over time. And if you can kind of look at this table, you can see there's bold print. Notice almost all the years are bolded for outdoor activities, which means that these were significant differences. And the differences at, at five years prior was an hour, an hour, an hour, 0.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.4 to onset. And that's the difference in hours between the two groups. And you notice there's no bold, or there's one bold, uh, computer games at the early age between the two. But other than that, there's really not much difference in activity for near work type of activities. So again, they replicated their Arenda study. I should say, though, now that I think about it, the Arenda data is included in the CLEAR data. Anytime they do a CLEAR study, then the Caucasians in the CLEAR study are from the original Arenda data. And this collapses across everybody. So there is some confounding of the data. It's not a pure replication here. Um, so they did this study. Now, um, they decided to analyze their data again uh, later on. And again, it's the clear data. Again, it's the same group looking at the differences. They're actually, well, there's a few more people. Now there's 835 myopes. But uh, they, they did it again. And, and um, this time they did, uh, did not find a difference in any of the activity measures. But I have to tell you, their statistical method was really crazy. This, well, it wasn't crazy. It was a good idea. It's just that the measure itself, the way they collected the data, and the error of the data in terms of measurement error um, was um, pretty uh, bad. So, for example, reported hours per week across all five activities that exceeded 82 hours were deleted. I don't know why I got that little symbol in there, but uh, that was 19 because it was assumed that 82 hours per week outside of school were not reasonably available. Their numbers of hours of activity were wildly variable in terms of total amount of activity. So they went anywhere from all five activities being 10 up to 10 hours, 10 to 20 hours a week, all the way up to 82. It was a a very wide distribution. And then what they tried to do was control each year. They would see how much activity was for year four. And then when they uh, looked to see if year three had an effect, they would control for the hours of activity in year four. So make everybody the same and then see if they added that much more activity in three in at year three prior to onset goes counts down five four three two one zero and so they expected that their measure would detect a change in one year of activity and given the variability of this measure it's just not reasonable to assume that you could tease out an effect of any activity in the noise of this measurement. And so they published it, but I think it was a bad idea. 
But anyway, so this is a, a no for activity. Most of them are yeses. We can look here, and on this page, our since, pretty much since the two, 2007 articles of Arenda, everybody's jumped on uh, this bandwagon. And this was a study of young Asian children. Uh, they found that, oh, I copy that the red down here is uh, is ones that failed whoops that's two so this guy actually is down here chua that was young asian children and they did not find a difference between near work or outdoors but all these other folks did find a difference they ran a study myopia in young adults is inversely related to objective marker, markers of ocular sun exposure. Western Australia. Um, this was, and they, they found that um, outdoor activity was significant. Uh, this was a 23 year follow up study, goodness. And they found that sports and outdoor activities in childhood uh, was related to myopia. Uh, this was an interesting study. It was a monozygotic twin study. In other words, identical twins. And they measured, they, they had 63 pairs of these, and they measured whether or not, or how much activity each one did. And they found that in identical pairs, there was uh, the more activity, the, if, if one twin did more activity than the other, that twin was less likely to become myopic than the other. So that was a pretty strong study. It showed that it was some environmental factors. And uh, uh, I don't say it here, but it was outdoor activity. And in India, they did a study showing that um, both near work, watching television, and playing computer, and an inverse association with outdoor activities. So they found both near work and outdoor activities were significant. And uh, Wu in Beijing, China, also did a study and encouraging and, and found this um, outside was uh, protective. And they suggest that encouraging children to go outside for outdoor activities during class recess and after school may be a promising feasible intervention against myopia development. Now all of these studies are observational and while everybody starts out equal, there or coming out of the same basic population. It's a good, it, this longitudinal study is a, is a good design, but you don't know what happens as people drop out as, um, or just what goes into the, the differences that you don't notice at the beginning. We can recall again our quality of design hierarchy. We had this in evidence base where there's meta-analysis, randomized controlled trials, randomized controlled trials, single trials, something called propensity analysis, which we haven't covered, longitudinal cohort studies, that's the Arenda and CLEAR study and all the ones we've talked about so far, case control when you, uh, it's after the fact, <clears throat> and you go back and find cases of myopia, cases of non-myopic, and in the record and then look to see what was different over the past. That's a pretty bias prone design. And then there's a crossover snapshot. And the problem there is you don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg, because you collect all the data at the same time. You don't know if nearsightedness keeps kids from going out or if kids going outside make them nearsighted. So a crossover is kind of weak for these, this particular process as well. 
I'd like to talk a little bit about propensity analysis. I think this is going to replace longitudinal and case control studies over time because you use basically the same data. You, uh, uh, you have uh, data that's been collected over, over a fair amount of time and uh, then you match. Now in randomized controlled trials, we, we get a person into the study and we randomize them to one group or the other. Then the next person comes in and they're randomized to a group. And there's no bias in terms of uh, unevenness. Now, there is going to be unevenness, but it's accounted for in the statistics. And that's why you see the these T distributions and various things, they have lots of variability in them. Well, that variability is to take into account the those known and unknown factors uh, between groups that just are going to uh, be a little different. So randomized controlled trials minimize bias. Now in propensity analysis, it's like longitudinal case control studies in the sense that you don't randomize people into groups. Uh, I did a propensity analysis once on uh, the effect, the impact of seat belts on pediatric guts. Uh, if if a kid was a little kid was in an accident, um, did the seat belt create an internal organ injury, and were there more organ injuries, internal organ injuries, in children that were in car crashes that came to the emergency department of Columbus Children's Hospital? Were there more injuries with kids that had seat belts than kids that didn't? Now, clearly, we cannot randomize seatbelt use. Not only can we not randomize, but even if we could, um, there aren't that many accidents. So you would not only have to have somebody come in to the ED from a crash where they were injured seriously enough to come into the hospital, but they would have to be in the study. And that's just not practical. Uh, propensity analysis would have been very useful in the time that they were uh, studying uh, the effects of smoking. And you could control for all kinds, because that was always the argument. People are different. Well, with propensity analysis, you control for all the known factors. But you can't control for unknown factors. And kind of make the assumption that in doing this propensity analysis, you accounted for everything that's pretty important. So um, observational studies attempt to control for the known factors by using things like multiple regression and logistic regression. But while that is a start, it cannot control for unbalanced levels in factors. Uh, for example, well, and then another thing about those is that ob observational studies allow you to control variables until the right ones are controlled. In other words, you can futz around and torture your data forever until you get something that makes it come out and looks right. In pro propensity analysis, on the other hand, is a two-stage process. You first match the groups. So you don't know what the outcome variable is, or you don't consider the outcome. It's not, it's not in your radar. It's not in your equation. In logistic regression or regular regression, the outcome variable is in the model. We don't put the outcome variable in the model. And uh, instead, we match the groups, and then we test the factor between the groups. Now let's take our example. So I did a propensity analysis on the clear data. I have the data set, and I just said, well, I'll do this and see what happens. Uh, a longitudinal study, the longitudinal study itself, included children who were in the study at least five years. So I collected data for myopes on the fourth year prior to them becoming 
diagnosed with myopia. And I matched those children which who, who, with children who had not become myopic after five years. And I aged matched them. So if there was a kid that was eight years old, four years before he became myopic, I would match him with an eight-year-old child who was um, with an eight-year-old child. He, did, he did, and didn't become myopic any time that I observed, any time that he was in the study. So we matched the kids, and, and so how did we match them? Well, we used logistic regression. We used the clinical exam variables to determine the probability of whether a child would be myopic. So we had all the kids in the study, and we predicted using the clinical exam variables whether or not they would uh, become myopic. Now kids with lower spheres uh, tended to have a higher probability of being myopic. So we're going to we're going to match a myopic kid with a low sphere or a, or a low set of variables, sphere being one of them, with an an H-matched emetropic kid who has the same probability of being myopic at some time in the future. And so we take away that difference in the uh, variables. So you don't get a set of kids that are never myopic with high spheres versus a set of myopic kids with low spheres. They all, and, and sphere is just one example. This is, there's actually 27 variables that we use to match them. And that we match them based on their probabilities. And so the, uh, the probability of being in one group or the other. So if you were a never myopic kid with a low sphere, you'd have a, your probability would be high for myopia, even though that's wrong. And if you were a myopic kid with a, with a high sphere, you'd be matched with another emetropic kid with a high sphere or high set of variables like that. And so we matched them. And out of the 600 children that we had to match, we were only able to identically select 68 pairs. That's 136 kids. So 136 kids could be matched on their clinical measurements. Now, then, once we had these kids matched for their ocular signs, we then looked at that we now had the two groups. We had non-myopes and matched myopes. And then we looked at their outdoor activity. Now their outdoor activity was not based on the exam variables. It was based on the parent survey. So there was no link other than, I mean, it was, it was the parents observing the kids, but it was the kid's physical eye that was used to predict myopia. Now we look to see if there was a difference in activity. And so we look over at this graph over here, and we see outdoor activity had an effect size of 0.5 after we controlled for all the ocular instruments and that signet that difference was significant not overlapping bars are significant now we can see that the myopic orange bars are higher for both tv and near work but uh, uh, they weren't significant so uh, so propensity analysis is actually um, a pretty good design and method of analysis for controlling for this bias between groups that might arise in non-randomized trials. And it can be applied where in situations where you just you can't randomize people into myope or non-myope and then go back and see what they were. It's even kind of hard to randomize into activity, although in a few minutes we'll talk about some studies that have done that. No, oh, I guess we're going to talk about it now. So randomized trials. There are two 
that I know of in China. Um, this one by Jin down here was actually, I think, the first one. And uh, but in both cases, uh, let's talk about this one because there's more subjects, more schools. This one only looked at two schools. Up here, they randomly selected six intervention schools and six control schools. And they looked at 952 students, uh, or 950 about, in each school. And in the intervention school, the intervention was one additional 40-minute class of outdoor activities. That was scheduled each day. That's the only <laughs> difference. I mean, a 40-minute outdoor activity was added. And additionally, though I don't know how much of an effect this had, parents were had a meeting at the schools, and they were encouraged to engage their children in outdoor activities after school, especially during weekends and holidays. Children and parents in the six control cities continued their usual pattern. Now, they followed them for three years. After three years, the intervention group, 30% of the kids developed myopia. 30% of the kids in the uh, Extra 40 minute group, 30% became myopic. And the other one, it was 39. So there was a 9% difference uh, between the two in developing myopia. There was also a significant difference in spherical equivalent, as you might expect, but there was not a significant difference in axial length. Actually, in this one, where they did one child each, they uh, found a uh, difference in axial length as well as onset. But just getting 40 extra minutes prevented 9% of the cases. Now, if you're talking to an individual person and say you have a 1 in 10 chance of not getting myopia, you know, that's not totally convincing as being a great thing. But if you have, you know, what was it? almost a billion people having myopia, or, or let's say, even if it's just, let's say, 10 million people getting myopia over the year. And you can keep a million of them from developing myopia. And you're spending, you know, several hundred dollars every year with that. That's beginning to be real money. So that's why it's a public health thing, because from a public health perspective, you're saving a ton of cash. From an individual person, you know, it's it's a little questionable, but but you still reduce a person's chances. So uh, it's not a huge definite thing. No optometrists are going to go out of business with this, but it's going to have a big public health consequence. Okay, so what is it about outside? Um, and I think I mentioned that we have uh, shown that we, we've looked at the chemical cascade. Um, it's basically a dopamine kind of thing that sends a stop signal to somehow sends a well sends a stop signal to the sclera and basically creates things that block uh, or, or blocks the release of growth hormones that go to the growth hormone receptors in the sclera. Uh, another thing about that is w there's been chick studies, and I, I'm yet to verify that it's this way in humans, but when chicks are born, there are lots of those receptors on the sclera, and within a very short period of time, they've lost half of theirs. Well, you know, we for humans, our eyeballs, even though we're myopic, they don't grow out the back of our head. Something stops them, and it's probably the loss of those um, growth hormone receptors on the sclera over time. So then it becomes really harder 
for the eye to grow as you get older. It's not, it's not impossible. But after the early days, eyes can't grow all that uh, much. But our argument is that it's light, light that's doing it. Now, in the cascade, there's, there's a bit of peripheral refraction in the argument, too, because in, in the cascade, if the focus in the amacrine cells, if, if the amacrine cells get signals from a myopic defocus, they do not release dopamine. But if it's a hyperopic defocus, they do. So it's it's light in conjunction with this uh, peripheral factor. We also think there's a good case that it's uh, blue light because the uh, S cones are in the periphery, and it seems that most of the focus information that's related to eye growth is there. So to kind of look at this uh, this light perspective, Moody did a study on looking at vitamin D levels. The uh, the thought was that um, well, my thought about vitamin D is that if you have a lot of vitamin D, it's going to show that you've been exposed to sunlight. He actually thinks it fits in the chemical cascade. In my reading, I have not found much where vitamin D does much with that chemical cascade. Now, it turns out he did not find an effect, but he had 22 subjects, 14 myopes, and 8 controls. Now, come on. <laughs> it's not that big of an effect. You need 34 in each group to find a half standard deviation. So he's way short. And the fact that he didn't find it isn't surprising at all. And in fact, the trends were in the directions you would expect. So um, I, I, again, this study's published as a negative one, but I think it's instructive, but the sample size wasn't anywhere near close enough to find a difference. Um, there have been some other vitamin D uh, studies with mixed results. We have two green ones, which means they found a relationship between vitamin D. That is, the more vitamin D, that would imply more outside, that would imply less myopia. And that's what they found. Um, the red one here was there was no effect. So positive effect, no effect. Uh, so a few years ago, I had an idea about looking at lipofusion, and I was asking, uh, do optometry students accumulate more lipofusion than non-optometry students because they're sitting in front of slit lamps, a BIO, and all of that. And if you'll recall, lipofusion is a waste product that accumulates when the little discs on the cones are blown up and they fall into the RPE and are recycled. When there's a lot of excess light, then not all these materials can be recycled, and they're collected and converted into this waste product, lipofusion, which accumulates in the RPE uh, lysosomes. So my thinking was, well, um, Let's look at the baseline data. And these are optometry students. We have first years, second years, and the health professions campus, not optometry students. And our theory is that there's more. Well, um, so if you're myopic, you're not going to be outside as much. You're not going to be exposed to as much excess light. You're not going to have as much light effusion accumulation as opposed to non-myops. So we had three groups, first year, second years, non-optometry, and we did it, measured them the first year, and non-overlapping bars are significantly different. You can see that 
optometry, first year optometry myopes had less accumulation. We, we measure accumulation because one of the components of lipofusion is this bisretinoid called A2E. And when light comes in, it's a, it, for, that A2E is fluorescent and it kicks back uh, a light that can be measured on an autofluorescent with an autofluorescence camera. And the luminance goes from zero to 100. And so the luminance is our proxy of light diffusion accumulation. Now here you can see myopes are less accumulation than non-myopes uh, for first years. It's also significantly different for second years. It's also significantly different for non-optometry students. Uh, you'll notice these guys are high and these, as high as the second years, which was uh, damaging to my theory of light going into the eyes of optometry students. But I have an alternate explanation for why these guys are higher, if anybody would like to listen to it. So, um, let, I guess two years now, 2015, Zadnik and Moody uh, wrote a summary, basically. It's not a review paper, it's just kind of like an editorial. And they point out that since the first publication in 2007 to 2015, a lot of work was done. I mean, this is an amazing, fast thing from there's no way it can be outdoor activity. That doesn't even make sense. Two, outdoor activity seems to be the most likely cause. And light and peripheral refraction uh, and the fact that you're in focus in the periphery when you're outside uh, those those things help to explain why how um, how myopia is controlled. So uh, I guess the question for me is, how long should we wait before we do something? How convinced do you have to be that it's important to be outside? Uh, that it's important to suggest to your parents, your parents, your patients, that they should do outdoor activity, particularly your young patients. They should play outside. I know that's hard sometimes in our current culture, but being outside seems to have an effect. And the reason it's outside is because I believe you need that blue light component that is available in full spectrum light outside. Now one could ask, can you just bring full spectrum light bulbs inside? Is it just light or is it light in combination with focus? So if you brought it inside and studied with blue light, you would still have the issue of peripheral defocus. So that's uh, studies that need to be done, but definitely now going outside. And just so that as an example, the Surgeon General came out with a report in 1964, and he said smoking was bad. Before then, there were commercials on TV of smoking being almost a health food, a way of relaxing after the stress of a day. And, um, if, if you, I mean, uh, I'm going to put a link to a John Oliver video, on, and that could be the last half hour of this uh, talk, on smoking. It's pretty funny, but pretty interesting in terms of all the things, and also pretty tra tragic. But there were 7,000 scientific articles related to smoking and disease already available at the time in the biomedical literature, the advisory committed, committee concluded that cigarette smoking was a cause of lung cancer 
and laryngeal cancer in men, a probable can cause of lung cancer in women, and the most important cause of chronic bronchitis. 7,000 articles. And we know that tobacco kills. Evidence was there, action, tobacco lobby was very strong, still is, but uh, you can see that, uh, that it's a problem. So how long should we wait? So I would like for you, uh, oh, what's, what did I put in there? Oh, yeah. I would like you to consider a homework assignment. It's on Moodle. You'll get your credit. This is this is your assignment to get credit for this week. I want you first to make a statement on whether or not optometrists should not worry about preventing myopia. I actually uh, have a pretty good friend who has uh, actually helped me on that light perfusion study. It, it was really originally his idea to look at it with respect to A and D. David Glade, probably nobody knows him. Anyway, he, I was telling him about, you know, doing this stuff on myopia. He says, who cares? I'm a minus six diopter myopia, and I'm fine. And so you may or may not think that myopia is a problem. Make a statement, yes or no. Uh, number two, I wanted to show that public health is not just providing free care. It includes activities that prevent disease. So what will you tell your pediatric patients and their parents about ways to prevent myopia? Write a script. And I mean, obviously not going to read something in front of them, but write a script as to what you would say. It doesn't have to be very long, just a half a page. Uh, second, what could you do in your local community to promote policies that prevent myopia? You know, we're not all about the federal government coming down and ruling our worlds. All politics are local in this case. What would you do locally? You know, be specific about how you would address school boards and other community bodies. What are you going to do to get kids outside, young kids outside, so that um, you can prevent myopia. Now, it's definitely not a uh, completely done deal that outdoor activity prevents myopia. There's probably a lot of other causes, well, there are a lot of other causes related to the development of it. Like we said, a little bit goes a long way when you're talking about millions of people. And so your assignment then is to go out and uh, check that out. Okay, well that's it for this uh, lecture. I hope this has been an acceptable way of uh, covering a snow day. Thank you.